Amen. Good morning. Is Nathan Hess here? Nathan, come up here, please. Yeah, you get called at the front of the room. You know you're in trouble, right? <laughs> well, I hope you're enjoying the, the, uh, the new chairs. Uh, they came in on Wednesday for anybody who was surprised. A lot of help, a lot of work to get them up here. And Nathan has nothing to do with the new chairs. <laughs> but he does have something to do with the thrill of being church family and, and following Christ. Because just over a month ago, uh, he was baptized into Christ. He chose to take his life and make it uh, a, a, a disciple's life. Christ. Many of you were here for that, and uh, but at the time, partly because of moving and partly because of a lot of things, we didn't have uh, of the congratulations gift that, that we wanted to give him. So we like to give out a Bible uh, because God's word is the thing to guide your life. And since you've chosen to follow Christ, uh, this is a Bible. It's a nice small travel Bible, a good version for you to read and study and take with you. Let's pray together. Father, dear Lord, you're awesome. We love to see a, a young man like this uh, stand up and say, I'm going to follow you and listen to you. We pray that you'll guide Nathan, uh, strengthen his life, strengthen his faith, and help him to be the man that you need him to be in service to your kingdom. We pray that we serve him well as a family and love him uh, every day as we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the verse for the lectureship next weekend is it's from 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Thank you. I need that. First John chapter 5, we'll, we'll read into it. Verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes, that has overcome the world, our faith. The theme of our lectureship coming up is faith is the victory. And I thought about lessons for today to look into that, to see what does it mean that faith is the victory? And I, I, I wanted to pick a man with just a teeny tiny amount of faith. Jesus talked about him. A man with just a little bit of faith. Not a powerful man of God that, that uh, uh, shut down crowds and wowed kings and all the rest of it. This man wowed kings, but not in the, in the easy way. So we're going to turn to look at faith. And look what it means that God's commands are not burdensome. We're going to look at 2 Kings. Jesus said there were a lot of lepers in Israel. There were a lot of lepers in Israel is what Daniel wrote to us. Now that Jesus was rebuking his hometown because they were angry with him. They didn't like what he had to say about himself. And eventually, they, they didn't like what he had to say about them. But he said there, was, there were a lot, of lepers in his, a lot of lepers in Israel. But none of them were healed. Except Naaman, the Syrian. 2 Kings 5, if you will. Naaman wasn't just any Syrian. In the Old Testament, uh, the, the, in, that, in those days, the, the nation was called Aram. 
So when you read in your Bible, Aram, R-A-A-R, I can spell, A-R-A-M, you're reading Syria. So 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man also was a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Mighty in battle, mighty in effectiveness, mighty against his enemies. And oh, by the way, one of his enemies was Israel. And, and Naaman was an effective leader and a victorious leader, not because Naaman was so good, but because God, our God, had given him victory. So you wonder why do our enemies prosper? Why do those who spit in the face of God uh, uh, do well in life? Why are their financial efforts successful? Why are their uh, uh, motivations in life so wrong and, let, and yet their life can look so good? Well, here's an example. Here's a man who was literally an enemy of Israel, literally attacked Israel, came against Israel, and it was God who gave him victory. God had many reasons for that, I'm sure, and we're going to read about one of them. Now, the hero of the story we find in verse 2. Naaman is a powerful warrior and probably chalks up his effectiveness to what, how, what a good leader he is. Well, obviously, I'm a good planner, I'm a good tactician, I'm a good leader, I'm tough, I'm clear. I'm strong, I'm wealthy, that's why I'm so good as a captain of the army. This man led the entire army. He answered directly to the king of Syria. But he had leprosy. His skin disease, whatever kind it was, whether it's like today's leprosy or something else, was debilitating, was difficult, was painful, and he brought it home with him, and it agonized him at home. We know that because this little servant girl in verse 2, maybe more appropriately called a slave girl, for she was an Israelite. This little girl was, was from Israel and had been captured by the Syrian army and dragged back. Maybe her whole family was captured. Maybe her parents were killed. Maybe just she was captured and dragged away from her family. Whatever it was, it had to be a painful, awful, terrifying transition for this child. And she served the wife of Naaman. She sees and knows how much pain the commander is in. And in verse 3 she says, I wish, what a sweetheart this little girl had. What a brave young lady this was. You want a hero in this story? We found her. She's in verse 2. And says to her mistress in verse 3, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. She's talking about Elisha, which is what Jesus had referred to back in Luke 4. Not, I wish he, was, he found the prophet Elisha so Elisha could cut him down, enemy of my my home. She has the tenderness of heart and the empathy and the, and the care for even her enemy, even her owner, to wish him well and to wish him to know the blessings of God. Naaman hears about the story, goes to the king, says there's a man in, in Israel who can heal me. The king the king, you don't just send your commander to the enemy territory. The king writes a letter to the Israel king, to probably Joram at the time, although he's not named, he's not in this story by name. And he sends a letter, says, oh, I'm sending the commanders of my army because you've got a guy over there who can heal him. 
So what we have here is power, worldly power, in verse 1. Worldly power in verse 4, because he goes, the powerful warrior goes to the powerful king. And in verse 5, he departs and takes 10 talents of silvers, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. The changes of clothes weren't for him in the trip. The changes of clothes were elaborate clothes. clothes. Clothing was extremely difficult to have and extremely expensive in those days. And so this was uh, a masterfully made stuff uh, that he's bringing with him. And these are all gifts to whoever this is that can heal him of this terrible disease. Power, more power, and wealth. What's the victory that overcomes the world? What is it? Faith. We've got worldliness woven all through this stuff. I didn't skip over the hero. Right in between all that worldly power was our hero. Remember her? Our hero was right there. We run into, we go to another powerful location in verse uh, 7. And in this location, we find not power and confidence but we find weakness and fear. This is embarrassing, which is one of the reasons you know that God wrote this book and no man wrote this book, because the king of Israel is a, is a what do you want to call him, a wimp? I don't know what you want to call him. But he says, when he gets the letter, he says, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sending word to me it can cure to me to cure him from leprosy? He's, start, he's trying to start a fight. He's terrified. He's already tried to stop this general. He's tried to stop this general and his army. And now this guy is coming personally sent by the king of Syria. And rather than standing in strength, the one man so far who ought to be standing up strong is in weakness and fear. You're not finding any faith here. The victory that overcomes the world is faith. Faith. You're not finding faith in the king of Israel. If the king really had no idea, let's just pretend for a moment that he didn't have any idea how or who could cure this man of, his, uh, of, of leprosy, at least he knew that God could do whatever God wants to do. The very least he could say is, maybe God wishes to heal you, maybe he doesn't. You're welcome into our into our country something of confidence something of strength but no this guy sounds like me sounds like sounds like people today how am i possibly going to handle this i can't fix this who am i god to fix this kind of stuff ah faith every one of us can stand stronger than the king of israel in this case i don't know what god's going to do today or tomorrow but he, if he wants to he can do it if he wants to do it through us or through me, he can do that. Verse 7, the king of Israel, when he read the letter, he tore his clothes. Remember we said, that's why tearing your clothing in the, in the, in the Bible is such a significant event. It's because his clothing was so expensive. It was a sign of real desperation, a sign of real agony. When Elijah, when Elisha heard, verse 8, that, that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent word and said, why have you torn your clothes? What is wrong with you? It's a very pointed rebuke. Why have you torn your clothes? Now, let him come to me. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came, verse 9, with horses and stood in the doorway of the house of Elisha. So we've got worldly power in verse 1. We've got our hero in verse 2 and 3. We've got more power in verse 3, 4, worldly power. We've got wealth in verse 5. We've got weakness in verse uh, 7. We've got real confidence and faith in verse 8. And now more wealth in verse 9, worldly wealth. 
as Naaman comes, not just walking, not just riding his horse, but horses and chariots, wealth and power. Does Elisha come to the door and greet him? No. Nah. Does Elisha uh, uh, give him honor and the dignity of a, of a face-to-face conversation? Nope. You came here for a purpose? I'll send you a word about how to fix your problem. Go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. Doesn't even come to the outer door. And Naaman is furious. You rely on worldly power, worldly wealth, worldly status, and you don't get what you want. People don't bow down in front of you. You're going to be mad. You're going to demand some attention. Naaman was furious, says verse 11. Furious. What Elijah tells him to do is something very common for Jews. Now, for Christians, this is an obvious foreshadowing, right? For Christians, this is an obvious foreshadowing of baptism. Clearly, this is, baptism is being raised and put on a, a, a display in this story, specifically because it's a Gentile. This is somebody outside of the nation of Israel. But the Jews wouldn't have been surprised by a washing like this. In fact, by this time, they had developed into washing every week. They were baptized every week. In Jewish communities, they ended up building things they called a mikvah, mikvah however you want to pronounce it. And it was a ceremonial bath. The Jews had to be cleansed after all sorts of different events happened in their lives. If they touched a dead animal, they had to be cleansed. Uh, if they had uh, gone through some sort of skin disease of their own, they had to be washed and cleansed, et cetera, et cetera. There was a, there's a long list, and you can find it in Scripture, or at least a list of reasons to be washed. And finally, they ended up saying, you know what? I don't know if when I wiped off the table this morning there was a dead fly on the table. Maybe I touched a dead body. They were getting legalistic, in case you didn't notice. And so I might have touched something dead this week. I might have had a skin lesion on me somewhere this week. And so by Friday, or on Friday, the day before the Sabbath, almost every good Jew would go wash himself, would go have a ceremonial, not a bath, but a ceremonial baptism. He would be cleansed. They go down into the mikvah, dip down, and then walk back out. And then they'd line up on Friday afternoons before six o'clock so that every one of them could be cleansed before the Sabbath came. So this isn't surprising to the Jew. It's not surprising to the Christian, but it's it's infuriating to Naaman. Behold, I thought he surely would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Naaman had some sort of expectation about what he thought God should do and what he thought this prophet should do. Are not the home waters, he he mentions two of them, the rivers of Damascus better than the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Worldly power brings worldly anger. If you're dealing with selfish anger, dig down inside. If anger rises up in you, find out where and why. The source isn't God. God loves you. God finds you priceless and precious. It might mean you're relying on the things around you, like name and work and status. It might mean you don't believe God. And you, it might mean you don't think you're forgiven. It might mean you don't think you're worthy. You're so valuable to God, he put his own son on the cross. He loves you so much, he put his son in your place, in my place, just so he could be with us in eternity. If anger is a habitual problem, if it comes up quickly 
or even with any regularity, sit down with somebody, dig down and find out why. It's there for a reason and it didn't come from God. God's very clear of rebuking anger in the New Testament. Selfish anger. There is a place for righteous anger. Righteous anger is anger that's against things that are ruining people, ruining lives, hurting children. It's right to be angry for godly and righteous reasons. It's wrong to be angry for selfish and worldly reasons. And that's the more common one. That's the one that jumps up in our face. I said, kind of an anger. Yeah, me too, I know. So Naaman has worldly wealth, worldly power, and now he's got worldly anger. Well, the voice of reason rides in. Reason comes to Naaman's elbow in one of his servants. A good, brave servant. Maybe this is our second hero. Obviously, Elisha's an easy hero in here. But I like these side heroes. So this servant comes up to Naaman and says, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? How much faith does Naaman have at this point? None. I mean, any? Any? Is he trusting God? At least he acknowledged. He used the word Jehovah when he said, I thought the prophet would come out and talk to me and wave his hands and call on Jehovah. And at least he used God's name when he said those things. So he knows about the God of Israel. Ah, So maybe he's got a tiny amount. (sighs) Don't you hate it when you're angry and somebody talks reasonably to you? At least justify my anger by yelling at me. Then I have a reason to be angry because you're yelling at me. But when somebody's all nice and reasonable when you're angry, that just makes, oh, then it's all my fault. <sighs> Thanks a lot. So Naaman's furious is what it says. Seriously angry. The words are furious and rage. And the servant says, sir, if you had to ride the hills and attack some difficult place or do some athletic event or, 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 or state some sort of beautiful passage of scripture, wouldn't you have done that? Well, this is just dipping down in the water. Tr- try it. So verse 14 is our hinge point. This is the, 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 the climax of this event. So he went down. How many times? Seven. What's the victory over the world? Faith. Obedient faith. How much faith does Naaman have? We don't know, but it doesn't sound like a lot. He's got enough faith to get down in the water. One. He comes back up. Two. He comes back up. Three, he comes back up. How clean does he look? Nope. Three times doesn't clean you. Doesn't half clean you. Four, he comes back up. My theory, excuse me, it's not written in scripture. My theory is he's getting angrier. Five, he comes back up. That's just my own personal way of reading this. You don't have to, you don't have to go there. But he's getting nowhere five times. Six, he comes back up. I'm wondering if he has his attack plans in his mind, what he's going to do to either Elisha or any part of Israel when he comes back up seven times and all he is is wet. I think that's the kind of character he's shown us. Seven. His skin is so smooth, it's like a child's. The transition is so powerful, he's stunned. Everybody can see it. I don't know where the leprosy was 
obvious on his face, on his back, on his arms, on his leg. I don't know where it was on his body, but it was obvious. Faith is the victory. We stand back in our pride and our power and our status and our confidence saying, why doesn't God do things the way I think he ought to do things? How come God doesn't respond the way I want him to respond? All of that power and all of that wealth and all of that prestige didn't do Naaman any good at all. What did him good is when he humbled himself. I think that's one of the reasons we're baptized is because it's a humbling event. You don't look so good when you come back out except for the smile on your face. Obviously, you look awesome. But you're all wet and water running down. Your hair's all doing whatever. But you got this big smile on your face. It's humbling to die and come back up out of the grave, isn't it? So we return to the man of God. Naaman doesn't get it yet, but he's got it. He sees what's happened to him. So he goes back to the man of God. He says, I know now that there is no God in all the earth but Israel. You guys have the God. You have the real God. Please, take a present from your servant. Now the silver and all that gold and all ten ten changes of clothing come into play. But Elisha says... No. As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And Naaman says, sir, please, you have done me so much. You you deserve all of it. You deserve all of this and more. Please, let me give it to you. And Elisha says, no. Elisha's a wise man. It is not that silver and that gold that will make Elisha's life more joyful, more fulfilled, more purposed, more directioned. He knows where his strength comes from. He knows where his joy comes from. He knows where real power comes from. And then Naaman says, if not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of dirt. I want to bring some Israeli dirt back with me. Can I bring some of your dirt? And he says, sure. You can take dirt. He says, you know, when I get back, I'm going to have to walk into the the worship center uh, with the king. Is is Jehovah going to be mad at me if I walk in there? Because I'm I'm, I'm only going to worship Jehovah. But I will have to walk the king. And he says, go in peace. Naaman's repentant. Naaman is humble. Naaman's faith has grown from to something he can talk about. It doesn't take much faith because we have such a powerful God, but it has to be a faith that at least obeys him. In your life, in your home, let the obedience before God be an everyday event. Praise him. Worship him in your home every day. Pull your children close to you. Sing songs to him. Pray together to him. Read his word together. Lift up the Lord. Because faith is the victory that overcomes the world. The world is trying to ruin you and ruin your family. The, 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 The commander of this world, Satan himself, would like to kill you and kill your children and your wife and your friends. And God says, I have a pathway for you. I have a victory for you. But you have to have faith and you have to follow me. Naaman showed us the path. It didn't take much faith. But he got rid of his anger, didn't he? He still didn't know what to do with his wealth, but he was figuring it out. Give it away. Today, if there's any here that have not been baptized into Christ, 
We'd love to rejoice with you as we rejoiced with Nathan just a few weeks ago. If there's any here who have any need, put your trust in God. Have faith in him, in his path, in his word. Take Naaman's example. You may not know why baptism is the connection between you and Christ. You know what the scripture says, that it's the place where our sins are washed away. It's the place where we come in to the body of Christ. It's the, pl- it's the time, that's the event in which we're given the Holy Spirit. This is the great decision point to become a Christian, saying, yes, I want to be baptized. You may not be able to answer all the questions, but if you know enough to know who Christ is, why you're making your decision, and that that's what you want, that's all you need today. If you're ready for that or for anything else that we can help you with, please come forward while we stand and sing the song that Bruce has selected.